our next talk, which will be on data-driven AI for that sorry, for threat detection. Please join me in welcoming to the stage distinguished data scientist at Arista, Debabrata Das. All right. Hi, everyone. Hi, Debabrata. Thanks for joining yes. us. Sure thing. Thank you for inviting me. So let me share my screen. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, using data-centric approach to do security and uh, I'll specifically talk about network security. That's where my experience is. But I think the approach is general enough for any kind of security um, that people want to do. Uh, so a little bit about me. I, right now, I'm the distinguished data scientist at Arista. And Arista is a big network switch provider, if you already know. And uh, I came to Arista uh, because of an acquisition of my company, Awake Security. And that's where uh, I did a lot of work on network threat detection and response. Prior to that, I was the head of engineering at Cypher Cloud, where we did uh, cloud access and data security. And much before that, I was uh, doing threat detection using logs. And uh, so all my career, I've been doing data engineering, mining, ML, AI to detect threat uh, for the enterprises. So um, a, a lot of people in this uh, audience will recognize uh, a standard way to detect threat. Right? So the ML approach is you have a lot of payloads and you have labels with them. Like the payload could be some files and the label could say, this is a malware, this is a ransomware and all that. Right? And then you take them to the training process and you get a model and then you see a payload um, and you don't know what uh, the label should be and the model will predict that for you. And this works, right? We have also tried it and it works pretty well. So what are the challenges there? The first challenge is that um, you don't really have a lot of labels. Right? This is the um, uh, threats and they are really rare in the traffic and but they're still there. So you need to detect them. Um, so uh, the number of labels is quite low. And there is also the issue of new threats, like they come up every day. Right? Um, right? Do you wait for the label to be there before you can start detecting them? Right? So that's another challenge. And of course, like if um, we go to any new environment, we always find something unknown, right? not published, nobody knows, but they are still there. Right? So how do you address that? And let's say even if you get that, the next challenge is that um, you have like hundreds of models. There are hundreds of different kinds of threats. So you have to run them and uh, run them at packet speed because you are a network security provider. Right? And that's that will take a lot of uh, hardware and very expensive. And second thing is if these large models, like if you combine them, then um, they kind of hide all the information in the bits and bytes the weights inside this uh, nodes. So it's hard to explain why we got something. And explainability is very important in security because uh, you are taking somebody's laptop and saying, I'm going to format it because you have something bad in it, right? And that will affect the productivity significantly. So before taking that action, the security analysts have to be sure that there is something really bad there. Right? So, at this time, you will be right to think, oh, okay, you're talking about data-centric AI, and uh, we're starting with complaining about data, right? Um, how do you do data-centric AI then for security? The insight here is that it's something that I learned from my um, co-founder, like he's a uh, renowned security expert. So while founding our security, I said, okay, like his name is Gary Gollum, and Gary, um, like when all the security tools fail, you go into the network and you find something bad. And that's why you are such a good um, threat researcher. Right? What do you do different? His insight was that uh, when he goes into a new place, he first tries to model what is common in that environment. Um, so there are some organization level uh, things that are happening, some department specific, engineer does something, finance does something. And inside engineering, maybe part of the um, team access AWS part doesn't. So 
it tries to model um, the normal behavior of the uh, enterprise when he gets in there. And whatever he cannot explain, whatever uh, stays out, that's where all the bad things are. And not all of them are bad. Like every uh, enterprise has something unique, but all the bad things are here. So by spending a lot of time investigating those uh, data, he is able to find like all the uh, interesting stuff that uh, are useful. So uh, this is the key insight that led us to our application, our product. So uh, the, what we do is to address the lack of labels problem, we learn what is good. And the advantage here is that the labels are easily available. And uh, like once you know what is good, then everything else is bad or can be bad. So it's easy to find unknown threats. Right? You don't have to know what to look for to find what is bad. Then comes the challenge of scalability. So like all these models, they don't have to work on the packets. So we built an intermediate knowledge store and we call that security knowledge graph. And this knowledge graph keeps um, entities that are there in the network, right? And these entities are relevant to the security analyst uh, mental model, right? What are the devices? What are the services? What are the domains? And uh, what are the users using all those? And how do they interact with each other? So we, encode all that knowledge in the knowledge graph. We can do a lot there in the knowledge graph. What we found is that just encoding the state of the entity is like um, really helpful in scaling this um, solution. Right? Just saying this user is logged out versus logged in. So that's very helpful. And then the advantage of this uh, intermediate store is that you don't have to depend on one technique being addressing all the threats, right? So you can mix and match. Um, you can say this attribute of this entity uh, can be inferred by ML or can be inferred by domain knowledge, and you can combine all that together. You don't have to be um, like solving all problems with one approach. And finally, like since uh, the knowledge graph encodes a lot of the knowledge of the enterprise. The security analyst can write uh, heuristics on top of that using their domain knowledge to detect threats. And so there are like hundreds of such uh, heuristics in our systems and they capture uh, all sorts of threats. So how does it look uh, in the product? So we have network features, which have IPs, domains, and ports, which are like basic, basic level information. And then we do entity extraction with devices, applications, services, and users. And then we store them in the knowledge graph. Then we have domain expert heuristics, like they refine the knowledge graph with the knowledge they have. Okay, this kind of user agent is good. That kind of user agent is bad. Why would they be a like a block for a kind of string in a, a user agent? Right? So that is encoded in that heuristic. And we put that back in the knowledge graph. Sometimes, most of the times, like um, uh, the knowledge of the enterprise has some localized components, right? Uh, the uh, people who manage the network, they know what are the important devices, what are the important users and all that. That can also be encoded in the knowledge graph. And finally, we have the background process of AI and ML, like doing clustering, uh, anomaly detection, outlier detection, and applying simple classification and doing all that on top of that knowledge to keep enriching the data that we have there for the analyst to detect threats. And so the advantage here is that it scales well, it can combine a lot of techniques and it is explainable, which is uh, really important for us. Um, I briefly went over this. There is a blog um, that talks in a lot more detail about all these entities and how we extract them. Um, I'll encourage you to read this if you are interested. So here is how we use uh, that knowledge graph, right? Let's say I talked about finding unknown stuff, like how do you find unknown IoT devices in the network? And this is where we encode the knowledge of the domain expert. The domain expert says IoT devices typically don't run browsers, don't run desktop OS, 
don't run enterprise protocols, and don't talk to many destinations. And all that can be encoded using the properties of the entities that are already there in the knowledge graph. And this is what the security analyst would write. And then this will become a recipe that we can use again and again. Right now, like, we find a lot of stuff here, but like we used only five features, right? And we extract like thousand plus features from the network. So how do you uh, use those? Then we go back to using machine learning, right? So use a recommendation algorithm to find all other devices that are behaving similar to the ones that we found earlier, right? So uh, all these UID looking devices are those. And then we say, okay, they're, they're so similar to this uh, Apple TV, so most likely there'll be Apple TVs too. So this is one way uh, the SKG is useful in finding unknown IOTs, right? Now, how do you address that for threat detection? Like that's our bread and butter. And this is one of the threats that we detected using SKG. Like again, you can see a plot of the entities referenced here and similar heuristics being put together. And then it found um, something like a very important adapt. So uh, one of the devices had keylogger installed in. And then uh, we detected that and remediated that. Right? So uh, at this point, like, probably a lot of you recognize uh, these heuristic like uh, conditions, they look like uh, labeling functions, basically. And this allows us to uh, extract a model using weak supervision and enhance the detection process further, right? So that's where we are tying the, the heuristics to the original data instead of attaching it to the um, knowledge graph in the middle. Um, so one of the things that uh, like I kept talking about is explorability. Like once you have a model that we extract using which supervision, like how does the uh, explainability work? Right? So that's where like we use line and it kind of gives us a lot of the explainability back. It's not as like crisp as, okay, these are the five conditions it's matched. That's why it's a threat. But at least we know what feature uh, was relevant and why it uh, crossed the threshold. And then like we explain it uh, to the analyst that way. Right. So, um, so, so far, I have talked a lot about uh, like using SKG to find unknown threats. How about the known ones, right? Um, how can we detect those? So, uh, typically, um, like normal human being, they wake up in the morning, maybe check some sports score or uh, stock market. Uh, security people like us, we look for announcements of new vulnerabilities, right? And there are three researchers all over the world that are working on different kind of uh, detection uh, mechanisms. They find something and then they publish it, right? So this is uh, one of the recent research by uh, Microsoft Research. And then like, some people publish those in Twitter. And sometimes we have to access some of the underground forums like uh, to uh, find bad things being published there. Right, so uh, all this information is there, like, and once we know this information, then we have to immediately go back to see which of our customers is affected by this. And um, so the time is important here because like as soon as we know it, then we have to go back and see when they got affected and uh, has they been affected long time because this reports come usually uh, with some time delay. Like how do you improve uh, the time it requires to process all these and get to uh, finding the known threats that affects uh, our customers. So that's where I think like uh, this probably would look very familiar to a uh, lot of people here. Uh, this is entity extraction from text. And we, we look at all these articles and then we detect what are the threats that people are talking about. And from those articles, we also find what are the artifacts we should look at in the network, right? Uh, what are the typical IPs these threats reach out to? And URLs and uh, domains. And uh, this is all like um, uh, discussed uh, many, many times with, um, with relation to weak supervision 
and we use the same techniques to extract that and make our process more efficient. So in summary, right, um, these are the three basically I think highlights I would uh, like you to remember if nothing else. Right, for security detection, we need to model the good, not just the bad, right? So uh, modeling the good and encoding it in something that is reusable and uh, easily accessible helps a lot in finding what is bad. And the good also solves the, the data access issue because you can easily access them, they're easy to understand, and they're easy to model. And then combining ML with uh, heuristics with with supervision, they uh, work quite nicely because uh, the domain experts really think in terms of heuristics instead of uh, sitting and uh, labeling data. Like they can say, if I see this JNDI string in the user agent, then that's the bad thing. Instead of saying like, okay, here are the thousand uh, user agents, I'll label them yes or no, yes or no, if it is good or bad, right? So uh, weak supervision makes it easier for us to combine those things. And finally, uh, like uh, security as with many other um, like processes uh, involves a lot of text data and documents people publish, case information, and the retrospective and everything. So we can easily use weak supervision to extract uh, the threat signals from there and um, apply that in our network um, to detect um, those threats and uh, wherever we want to apply it. So that's all I had. Yeah, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. That was such a great talk. Thank you so much uh, for introducing us to this world of threat detection, uh, Dibobrita. So thanks. Um, we have some questions coming in from the audience. So Alexi asks, how do pen testers help to evolve threat detection models? So a pen tester basically find the uh, holes in the threat detection, right? So uh, let's say we deploy somewhere or any solution that gets deployed somewhere, then it's easy to miss uh, places where you don't have visibility. Mm -hmm. Even if the product is good enough to find the threat, maybe there is a network that we are not monitoring. There is, there is an application that we are not looking at. And uh, those kind of things um, they highlight and to help us uh, fix in those holes. Got it, got it, thank you. Um, a question on what you had talked about, about like, you know, extracting the entities and things from, from public websites or things like that. Is there a certain list of websites that you're tracking to be able to then monitor the known threats that are coming in or how do you- uh, There are many, right? Um, there are a list of uh, hundreds of them. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, uh, there are some awesome security lists in GitHub, right? So uh, they have most of them, but yeah, so we kind of monitor them. Got it, got it. Um, another more like general question, I guess, uh, with the theme of the conference, we're talking a lot about large language models and things like that. How do you see that being used in your domain, if at all? Could you maybe touch yeah. on? Uh, definitely, right? So uh, uh, we are also thinking about LLMs as everybody else. <laughs> um, one of the things that's harder in security is that um, like all this data is private, right? Um, yeah. One of our customers said, um, Right. You have the data that I don't want anybody to see, right? And right. we cannot just send it to OpenAI. Um, so we have to process it uh, on site. So, uh, and large language models require a lot of hardware. And uh, so the cost um, kind of uh, is too prohibitive right now. But um, yeah, like, uh, we're definitely thinking about ways to get around that. Got it. Makes sense. Yeah. Like the throughput of, well, first private data, second, lots of throughput of things yeah. to query. So the cost is high. Um, yeah. And then also, I think you touched on explainability being pretty important uh, yeah. as well for yeah. you. So that's probably also another factor. Um, I guess making it even more general, what are things in general, if people are new to the security space, um, what are things about applying machine learning in this space that, that you would like to point out as people may be interested that is different from just like other general machine learning problems? Like what are unique challenges to your space uh, that you can think of? Yeah, the challenges I described earlier, so the uh, there are not uh, too many labels, 
and when they are labels they are they drift very fast the moment you detect something then the adversaries are pretty smart and they they will change the ways um the third challenge i haven't discussed is that um, we have a lot of categorical data and a uh, lot of models they work on like numeric data right mm -hmm. so we have to work around that so probably that's the only thing i haven't talked about in this talk Got it. I know you talked a little about like, yeah, like threats changing and evolving. So when you train these models with even like, let's say weak supervision, which makes it easier to update, like how do you go about that evolving set of threats? And could you talk about a few techniques to to deal with that changes in label schema, changes in threats, et cetera? Yeah, you have just have to keep retraining, right? If it is a model, then you have to retrain. Mm -hmm. And um, a, basically, um, as I said, um, we have to keep on top of the trends in the threats. And mm. then you have to see how that will affect your model. And you first change the uh, the labeling functions, then you retrain to uh, try to find the new kind of instances for those threats. Got it. And do you have like any sort of schedule that you keep for even monitoring and then retraining and updating these models? Uh, it's continuous, like so there is no schedule. <laughs> yeah. How often do you generally need to do that, uh, would you say? Uh, so this process uh, we are putting in right now. So like right now it's uh, probably biweekly, but uh, like uh, we are learning and seeing. So we already have this um, like security knowledge graph and heuristic on top of that to detect mm -hmm. threats, right? So we first try to approach that way and then try to generalize it more using ML, right? So we have some leeway. We don't have mm -hmm. to like immediately run the same thing. Right? Got it. Got it. Makes sense. Um, Karan says, great talk. Any other explainability techniques that you've used instead of Lime? Um, and then there's a second follow up, but I'll pause here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we tried a few others, um, layer, but I think Lime um, was the best one. Our users liked it. Got it. Got it. Uh, the second part of Karan's talk is, uh, question is, do you use graph neural networks? No, uh, we don't use that right now. Got it. So something maybe you'll explore. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's in our roadmap. Uh, we haven't had to, time to get to that yet. Makes sense. Okay. Um, Novina asks, how accurate are your labeling functions? Does it depend on the accuracy of your model during training? Um, um, so, uh, like, the, so we have pretty good um, domain experts. So I would say uh, the accuracy is pretty good. Mm -hmm. Right, um, like one example, recent example is with just using the labels, we could get uh, 0.97 uh, accuracy mm -hmm. and using ML on top of that, we could get to 0.99. So they're pretty close. Right? So, but uh, 0.99 is much better than 0.97. Yeah, makes sense. And then as we talked about, I mean, with generally with Snorkel as well, we talked about the labeling functions don't need to be perfect. We can denoise de them and then the model mm -hmm. training just helps even, even more. Uh, so that makes sense. Um, another, I guess, higher level question for you. I know you talked about some of the use cases. What are other high impact areas that you see, you know, maybe machine learning projects that you haven't tackled yet, but like um, what are other parts of the security space that you're excited to tackle using machine learning next? Uh, security is a very vast space. Right? Yeah. So like, we have focused only on uh, the network uh, data and detecting threat there. Uh, there is a lot of... Um, opportunity in making like uh, applying ml for the prevention part right so mm. can you um, use ml to detect uh, bugs in the software which people uh, exploit to get into networks right um, I, I think there is a lot of opportunity there and how do you uh, see the user account misuse even though the user is actually allowed to use the service how do you model his behavior or her behavior and um, see if it is being misused hmm. and um, how do you restrict the access to the need to know uh, services or the accounts right right so it's quite big and i think ml has a role to play everywhere um, it's like limited by the imagination i guess Makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, already we've covered a lot on your roadmap, just in terms of even techniques, <laughs> all the yeah. way to brand new projects. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, so Alexi asks, your data sets are very imbalanced, right? Because you probably yeah. don't see that many stress. So like, how do you handle that challenge for classification? Yeah, uh, so that was one of the original challenges. Like, we don't have enough labels and we have a lot of uh, like, uh, good data, right? Mm -hmm. 
So uh, this is where um, I think uh, weak supervision helps, right? So by using the heuristics, we increase the labels and mm -hmm. we try to find normal data that is kind of balanced with respect to the uh, threat data. That makes sense. Like if you are going through and manually labeling, most of this would be non-threat and it will take you quite yeah. some time. But with labeling functions, you can very quickly surface the threat data. Um, yeah. I'll extend it a little further, but like what about cases where, you know, we we're talking about known threats, unknown threats, like there's threats you may not have seen, so they're not even in the data. So do mm -hmm. you use a lot of like synthetic data techniques or, or how do you handle that sort of like not even in the training data sort of cases? Yeah, those, uh, like, those are the kind of um, things that uh, our knowledge graph is pretty good at uh, mm -hmm. finding. Right, so uh, those will show up in the outlier or anomaly mm -hmm. region of the, um, the attribute graph. And then we can use heuristics on that to start finding them instead of hoping that we can train a machine learning model uh, fast enough. Got it, got it. Okay, one last question Dana asks, um, your LinkedIn is not coming up. So maybe <laughs> uh, did, okay. it, did it change? Um, Maybe you could put uh, it in the chat or also in, in the Slack. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll fix it. <laughs> yeah. I think you also shared an um, interesting blog post. So maybe if you, you're, you'll be on Slack later as well, right? I, to I'll answer be on Slack, yeah. any questions. And then if you could post that blog post as well as a link to your LinkedIn, I think people are excited to connect, ask you more questions. Um, Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for that uh, talk and for all the questions there, Roberta. Very great to uh, have you here. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks. Bye. Bye.